welcome to the lesson 3 on the course strength of material. We are going to discuss about analysis of stress. We have already looked into some aspects of the stress analysis. Now, it is expect, expected that once this particular lesson is completed, one will be able to compute stress resultant and stresses in members subjected to axial forces, evaluate stresses at a point on a body at any arbitrary plane, evaluate principal stresses and look at principal planes and compute stress invariance. Hence, the scope of this particular lesson includes review of normal stress, which we have already discussed in the last lesson, the concept of shear and bearing stress, computation of stress on any arbitrary plane, concept of principal stress and principal plane, and concept of stress invariance. Well, in the last lesson, we had looked into what are the types of stresses and specifically we discussed about the normal stress and we had noticed that if we take a body which is actually loaded let us say by a force E and if we take a section and draw the free body diagram. this body is under the action of external force P. So, at the cart section say A A, there will be resulting stress component, which we have called stress resultant or the force which is resisting P. At every point, there will be stress component, the normal stress multiplied by the area will give the force. So, integral of stress multiplied by the small area integrated over this surface will give the stress resultant, which is equal to this P. Now, by making this kind of assumptions that everywhere same state of stress exists, if the force acts through the centroid of this section. We assume that the material, the particle at every point contributes to the resistance of this external force and thereby we assume the homogeneity of this material. We assume that at every point the same state of stress exists. Now, when a body is subjected to the external forces which are trying to cause a traction in the member or trying to pull the member, we call this kind of forces and thereby the stresses as the tensile stress. Whereas, when the external forces are acting on the member, try to push the member, we call this kind of external forces and thereby the stresses as the compressive stresses. So, subsequently we will be looking into the concepts of the tensile and the compressive stresses. Let us look into the aspects on shear stresses, which we have discussed already in the last lesson. Now, let us assume that this particular body is subjected to the action of external forces P and the resistive forces thereby will be P by 2 and P by 2. Now, if we take the free body diagram of this particular member, if we cut it off here, then we will have this body, which is acted on by the external force P by T, P by 2. Hence, there will be the resistive internal force which is also P by 2. If we take the free body of the other part, 
the other part on the of the cart the resistive internal force is p by 2 and this force will be registered at this interface and this also will be p by 2 though this force is eccentric with respect to the central line of this body but the thickness being smaller we neglect the other effects because of these forces now this force will try to cause a stress at the contact between the these two elements and this contact area is shown here which is the plan if we look from the top this top view of this body looks like this and this faded part indicates the contact area between these two pieces of material. Now, if we consider that this particular length as A and this as B, then we can define the shear stress which is designated as tau as equals to the force which is acting at the interface which is P by 2 divided by A times B. A times B is the contact area over which the shearing stress exists. Many a times we come across situations where some blocks are resting over another block and transferring the forces from external sources. Now, for example, if we have a body like this in which this is a block which is resting on a bigger block and the smaller block is subjected to an external load P. If this block is placed, the centroid of the top block is placed at the centroid of the bottom block then at the interface between these two blocks at this interface there will be this normal stresses generated and these normal stresses we designate as bearing stress. By the term bearing we mean that the bottom block is bearing the load of the top block. So, if the contact area between the smaller block and the bigger block if this is equal to A C, then the bearing stress sigma bearing we can write this as the external force P divided by the contact area A C. So, this is called as a bearing stress. I can give you another example where uh, quite frequently we come across the concept of the bearing stress. Let us assume that we have a rigid bar which is resting on two supports. and this is subjected to external force P. Now, if we take the free body diagram of this particular bar, the external force is P. So, the resistive force at the support point assuming this P is acting through the centroid of this body is P by 2 and P by 2. And this the reactive force will be in turn will be transmitted into the support. So, if this is the support, this is the resistive force which is getting transmitted on. And depending on the contact area we have, if this is the length A and if we say the width of this body as B, then this force P by 2 has a contact area which is A times B. Hence, the bearing stress sigma bearing is equals to P by 2 as the reactive force which is getting transmitted on this support divided by A times 
B. Well, having known this normal stress, the shearing stress and the bearing stresses and also in the last lesson we have looked into that what are the kinds of stress components that act on any plane. Let us look into that what are the different stress components that can act on an any arbitrary plane. Let us consider that A, B and C is any arbitrary plane and O, X, Y, Z is the reference axis system. As we have noticed earlier in the previous lesson that the plane the normal to which coincides with the axis we designate that plane in the name of that particular axis. Likewise, this particular plane is the x plane on which the normal stress sigma x acts. Likewise, the plane O B C normal to that coincides with y direction which is y plane and the stress normal stress is sigma y on this plane and the normal stress on the plane A O C which is a z plane is sigma z. Also in those planes there will be the components of the shearing stresses on the x plane in the y direction we will have stress which we call as tau x y and tau x z. So, this particular one on the x plane in the y direction. So, tau x y and the component which is in the z direction is designated as tau x z. Likewise, the shear stress component which is on the y plane acting in the x direction we call that as tau y x and tau y z. Similarly, this is tau z x and tau z y. Now, let us assume that this arbitrary plane has a normal which is the outward drawn, outward drawn normal is n. Now, this unit vector can be designated with reference to the x y z plane. Let us assume that this is the reference plane, reference axis x y z and the unit normal is drawn here. Now, if this vector makes an angle of alpha with x axis, beta with y axis and gamma with z axis, then we define the cosine components of cosine components in the x direction as n x n suffix x which is cosine alpha n y which is the cosine beta and n z as cosine gamma and thereby the unit vector can be represented this distance can be represented as n x square plus n z square and n z square plus n y square gives this unit. So, we have in effect n x square plus n y square plus n z square as equals to 1. So, let us assume that on this arbitrary plane we have the resulting stress vector as r and the component of this resultant stress on this plane in the x, y and z direction b 
R X, R Y, and R Z. Also, let us assume that the area of this particular plane A B C is D A. Let us assume that the area of the arbitrary plane is D A, which is the area of the plane A B C. Now, if we take the projection of this area on x plane, which is A O B, so area of A O B is nothing but equals to d A n x cosine of projection of this area A B C on A O B. Area B O C is the projection of that on the of area A B C on Y plane, which is D A N Y, and area A O C is the projection of A B C on Z plane, which is D A N Z. Now, if we take if we take the summation of all forces in the x direction, wherein the stress components involved will be sigma x, tau y in the x direction, tau z x in the x direction and r x. Then, we can write down the equilibrium equation in the x direction. So, equilibrium equation in the x direction will be r x to the area d a. So, this is the force, the stress resultant multiplied by the area minus sigma x d a n x that is the area of x plane minus tau y x which is acting in the y plane times the area of y plane which is d a n y minus tau z x which is in the z plane acting in the x direction multiplied by the area d a n z this is equal to 0. So, if we divide the whole equation by d a or in a limiting situation, we can write r x as equal to sigma x n x plus tau y x n y plus tau z x n z. Similarly, if we take the equations in the y and z directions and write down the equilibrium, we will get r y as equals to the tau x in the y direction times n x plus sigma y n y plus tau in the z plane y direction n z as r y and r z the resulting stress in the z direction is equal to the tau the x plane the z direction as n x plus tau in the y plane z direction times n y plus sigma z times n z are the three resulting stress components. So, the stress components on the arbitrary plane, which are acting in the x, y and z directions are represented in terms of the stress components in the rectangular coordinate system. And this set of equations 
normally designated as Cauchy's stress formula. So, Cauchy's stress formula is R x as sigma x n x tau y x n y tau z x n z r y is equal to tau x y n x sigma y n y tau z y n z and r z equals tau x z n x tau y z n y sigma z n z. Now, let us look into that if we consider a plane which has a normal n and direction cosines as n x n y and n z as we have defined before for the day n x n y n z are the direction cosines of the normal. Also, we assume that on that particular plane only normal stress acts and this normal stress acts in the direction of the normal to the plane. Hence, this normal stress if we take the components of this in the x, y and z direction then as we had designated before R x as the resulting stress in the x direction, R y as the resulting stress in the y direction and R z is the resulting stress in the z direction. They can be written in terms of the direction cosine that R x as n sigma n n x, R y as sigma n n y and R z as sigma n n z. Exactly in the same form the way we have evaluated the Cauchy stress formula taking the equilibrium equations in the x, y and z direction we can compute the, the resulting forces in x, y and z directions in terms of sigma n. In the previous case we had forces in the R x direction as R x times d a which was equals to sigma x d a n x plus tau y x d a n y plus tau z x d a n z and dividing the whole equation by d a we had R x as equal to sigma x n x plus tau y x n y plus tau z x n z. Exactly in the same form in place of R x now we have sigma n n x is the resulting for, uh, stress in the x direction. This multiplied by the area gives the force in the x direction. These are equals to sigma x times d a n x plus tau y x d a n y plus tau z x d a n z. Hence, from this we can write sigma n n x as equal to sigma x n x plus tau y x n y plus tau z x n z and this is what has been represented here the equation equations of equilibrium in three directions x y and z. Now, these equations can be rearranged and can be written as sigma x minus sigma n n x plus tau y x n y plus tau z x n z this is equals to 0. Tau x y n x plus sigma y minus sigma n n y plus tau z y n z is equals to 0. Tau x z n x plus tau y z n y 
plus sigma z minus sigma n n z equals to 0. And we have already seen in the last lesson that tau a y x and tau x y they are equal, they are the cross shears, tau z x and tau x z they are equal and tau z y and tau y z they are equal. Now, these three equations can be thought of as uh, simultaneous equations containing n x, n y, n z and we can evaluate the values of n x, n y, n z. Now, if we expand this particular equation, we will get a cubical equation in sigma n. And this is the cubical equation in sigma n. We have sigma n cube minus some coefficient times sigma n square, some coefficient times sigma n and some other coefficient which is equal to 0. And once we solve this cubical equation, we are expected to get 3 roots which eventually will turn out to be real and we designate those roots as sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3. And corresponding to each of these values of sigma, we will get the values of n x, n y and n z. So, here we have now the equations on the arbitrary plane on which the stress is absolutely normal and we have observed that we can get the simultaneous equations in n x, n y, n z in terms of sigma x, tau x y and tau x z, tau y z and sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Now, this cubical equation, let us look into the terms of I 1, I 2, I 3 and if for each of these sigma values, if we are interested to compute the values of n x, n y and n z, we can do that using these equations along with the expression which we have that n x square plus n y square plus n z square as equals to 1. So, for a trivial solution n x, n y, n z is 0, which is not really going to give us the solution because n x square plus n y square plus n z square is equal to 1. Now, for a non trivial solution of this simultaneous equation, we set the determinant of the coefficient of n x, n y, n z as 0. And if we do that, we have sigma x. we have sigma x minus sigma n tau x y and tau x z tau x y sigma y minus sigma n and tau y z tau x z tau y z and sigma z minus sigma n. So, if we set this determinant of this coefficient of n x, n y, n z as equal to 0 for non trivial solution, we get the cubical equation in sigma n, which I have already shown to you. Where the values of i 1, i 2, i 3 are, i 1 is going to be equal to sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z, i 2 will be equal to determinant sigma x sigma y tau x y plus sigma y 
sigma z tau y z plus sigma z sigma x tau x z and I 3 is going to be equal to sigma x sigma y sigma z tau x y tau x z tau y z and this being symmetrical x z x y tau x z and tau y z. So, these are the three coefficients i 1, i 2 and i 3. Now, the plane on which this stress vector is wholly normal is known as principal plane and this is what we had considered in the previous situation, where we had taken the arbitrary plane and we had considered the stress vector which is along the normal and thereby we had obtained the cubical equation in sigma n from which we have obtained the three roots sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 and in this particular plane the normal stress is acting along the normal of the plane. So, the plane on which this stress vector is wholly normal we call that as principal plane, we call that particular plane as the principal plane. Now, the stress on this principal plane which is absolutely normal we call that as a principal stress and since the stress acting is in the normal direction and there are no transiential stresses thereby. So, on a principal plane the principal stress is the resultant normal stress and on a principal plane there won't be any tangential or the shearing stresses and this is very important that on principal plane the shearing stresses are 0. Now, we have seen the cubical equation in sigma n from which we have obtained three roots sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 and we have looked into three coefficients i 1, i 2 and i 3 where i 1 is sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z, i 2 if we expand those determinants you will get in this form sigma x sigma y plus sigma y sigma z plus sigma z sigma x minus tau x y square minus tau y z square minus tau z x square and the third invariant the i 3 if we expand the determinant we will get in this form. Now, these we call as the invariant. Now, it is to be noted that the principal stress which you have calculated at a particular point remains the same irrespective of the reference axis system we take. In this particular case we have taken x, y and z as the rectangular axis system. Supposing at that particular point if we take a different axis system which is represented as x dash, y dash and z dash and corresponding normal stresses if we write normal and the shearing stresses if we write down which are sigma x dash, sigma y dash, sigma z dash and correspondingly the shearing stresses. Then we can observe that the values of i 1, i 2, i 3 which are represented in terms of the normal stresses and the shearing stresses they remain the same because the principal stresses at that particular point remains unchanged. And that is why these coefficients i 1, i 2, i 3 are known as stress invariant. We will go into more details when we look into the transformation of the stress system. Well, having this background of normal stress, shear stress and the bearing stresses and about the principal stresses, let us look into a few problems. How do we solve these stresses? in some physical problem. Now, in this particular example here there are two plates which are connected together by a bolt and it is subjected to a pull external force P. this is the plan of the two plates and if we take a section if we cut the plate here and cut the plate here and view from this side the section looks like this. 
So, the width of the plate is 200 millimeter and thickness of the plate is given as 10 millimeter and the tensile pull that the plate is subjected to is 50 kilo Newton. Now, we will have to compute the average normal stress at a section where there are no holes for the bolts. So, if we draw a free body diagram, if we cut the section here and draw the free body diagram, then we will have the plate, if we took in its three dimensional form, this is acted on by a load 50 kilo Newton. The width of the plate is given as the 200 millimeter and thickness of the plate is given as 10 millimeter. So, at this particular section, the resistive force for this external force 50 kilo Newton, which is acting through the centroid of this plate is R and hence R is also equal to for the on the equilibrium of these forces R is equal to 50 kilo Newton. Hence, the normal stress sigma at this particular cross section where there are no, no holes is equal to R divided by the cross sectional area which is equal to 50 times 10 to the power 3 so much of Newton divided by 200 times 10. So, this gives us the normal stress as 25 Newton per millimeter square and 1000 millimeter yields 1 meter. So, this is equal to 25 into 10 to the power 6 Newton per meter square and as you know already that Newton per meter square we designate as Pascal. So, this is 25 into 10 to the power 6 Pascal and since 10 to the power 6 multiplied with Pascal gives mega Pascal. So, we can write this as 25 mega Pascal. Also, we will have to compute the average shear stresses in the bolts. The force which is acting here gets transmitted from this particular plate to this plate through this connection, where these two plates are connected by the bolt. And as a result, if we draw the free body at this interface, the force P will get transmitted at this interface and the bolts, the two bolts which are connecting these two plates together will be subjected to this force P. So, we have one bolt here, we have another bolt here of diameter 20 millimeter and these two bolts will be resisting the force P by 2 and P by 2. The plate is subjected to the load P and this P is getting transmitted to the top plate through the interconnecting bolt. So, the force that will be resisted that the stress the force will be resisted by this bolt is half of this P. Hence, the stress that will be acting in the bolt, which is the force on this particular area, which we call as the shearing stress on the plane of the bolt. So, the average shear stress in each bolt is tau, tau average is equal to the force P by 2 divided by the area of the bolt 
this is pi by 4 d square and p being 50, so this is 25 is to 10 to the power 3 Newton divided by area is pi by 4 into 420 square, so this is 100, so 250 by pi. So, the average stress is equal to 250 divided by pi, which is Newton per millimeter square and as we have seen there is so much of mega Pascal. So, this is the average stress in the bolt. Thirdly, we will have to compute what is the bearing stress between the bolt and the plate. Now, the force when it is getting transmitted from one plate to the other, it is getting transmitted through this interconnecting bolt, two bolts. And if we look into the transmission of the force in a little greater detail, we will see that so this is the plate, we have two bolts, now this plate is being pulled by force P. Now, the transfer of force from the plate to the bolt, the bolts are here. So, when the plate is being pulled, this part of the plate, this is the bolt the half part of this particular plate get comes in contact with this particular bolt and there may be release of contact between the plate and the bolt surface. So, basically the plate is resting on this surface of the bolt. On an average sense, we take the projection of the surface which is the diameter of this bolt and the contact area here is the diameter times the thickness of the plate. So, the contact surface which we get is the half the perimeter the projection of which is d and the thickness of the plate at that particular interface. So, this is the area which is in contact with the plate and the bolt. And as we have seen that the bearing stress is a function of the contact area and so the sigma bearing is equal to the force P and since we have two bolts, the bolt each bolt will get, get half the forces. So, P by 2 divided by the area contact area which is d times t. So, this gives us the bearing stress. So, now here p by 2 is 25 into 10 to the power 3, so much of Newton divided by d is 20 times 10 is the thickness. So, this will give us the bearing stress. So, this is equal to 125 ampere. Let us look into another example problem, wherein we are interested to evaluate the principal stresses and the stress invariant. We have learned today how to compute the principal stresses from the cubical equation and the stress invariant component. Now, the stress, state of stress at a point is given by this this is the stress tensor, where sigma x is equal to minus 5 unit, sigma y is equal to 1 unit and sigma z is equal to 1 unit and tau x y is equal to minus 1, tau x z is equal to 0, tau y z is equal to 0. So, if we compute the stress invariance, then as we have seen, 
I 1 is equals to sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z and sigma x here as minus 5 plus sigma y is 1 plus sigma z is 1. So, this is minus 3 I 2 as equals to sigma x sigma y tau x y plus sigma y sigma z tau y z plus sigma z sigma x tau x z. So, from here sigma x is minus 5 sigma y is 1. So, minus 5 and tau x y is minus 1. tau x y is uh, minus 1 so i 1 we got as minus 3 i 2 is sigma x times sigma y as minus uh, 5 minus 1 plus 1 minus 0 plus minus 5 minus 0 which is uh, equals to minus 10 and likewise if you compute i 3 this is going to be equals to minus 6. Hence the cubital equation which we get is sigma n cube minus i 1 sigma n square. Now, here i 1 being minus, so this is 3 sigma n square i 2 is minus 10, so minus 10 sigma n plus 6 which is equal to 0. Now, you can now sigma n as equal to 1 we will make this function as 0. So, sigma n minus 1 is one of the root of this equation. So, sigma, sigma n minus 1 if we take then sigma n square. So, this gives sigma n cube minus sigma n square. So, plus o sigma n square. So, plus sigma n minus 1 plus sigma n minus 1 this is 4. So, 4 sigma n, 4 sigma n square minus 4 sigma n minus 6 sigma n plus 6. So, minus 6 into sigma n minus 1, this is equal to 0. So, we get sigma n minus 1 times sigma n square plus 4 sigma n minus 6, this is equal to 0. From this we get sigma n as equal to 1 and minus 2 plus minus root 10. So, these are the three roots of this equation and these are the three principal stresses and these are the three stress invariants I 1, I 2 and I 3. So, that is how we can compute the stress invariance and the principal stresses. Now, in this we have another example problem in which a mass is hung by two wires A B and B C and the cross sectional area of these two wires are given as 200 millimeter square and 400 millimeter square. And if the allowable tensile stress of this material, wear material is limited to 100 MPa, then you will have to 
find out that what is the mass m that can be safely supported by the weight. Now, this particular problem can be solved by taking a free body diagram of this and this problem I leave for you think about it, how to solve it and how to evaluate it. We will be discussing this particular problem in the next class. So, if we summarize that what we have learned in this particular lesson, we will see that we have looked into first we have recapitulated the different kinds of stresses that we have learned in the previous lessons and those lessons are and those stresses are the normal stress and the normal stress on an axially loaded bar, what is the maximum normal stress that acts on an axially loaded bar which we have seen as the axial pull P or compressive force push by cross sectional area and cross sectional area which is minimum which is normal to the axis of the bar. Thereby, we have seen the relationship between the normal stress and the corresponding shearing stresses. We have Today, we have uh, evaluated the stresses on any arbitrary plane, which we generally designate as Cauchy stress formula. And from this Cauchy stress formula, we have arrived at the concept of principal plane and the principal stresses. And we have said that the principal plane is the one on which the stress is fully normal and thereby the tangential stresses are 0 or the shearing stresses on the plane is 0. While computing the principal stresses, we have seen the different coefficients which we have designated as stress invariant, which we have said as I 1, I 2 and I 3. And you have noticed that I 1, I 2, I 3 are the functions of the normal stress at a point, which are sigma x, sigma y, sigma z and the corresponding shearing stresses at that particular point. We will look into more detail about the stress invariance when we go for the transformation of stresses and we have shown you some examples to demonstrate how to evaluate stress at different points. We have tried to give you the concept of the normal stress, we have computed the normal stress at a particular cross section. We have computed the shearing stresses in the bolt, where the normal force which is acting in the plate is transferred into the bolt cross section. Then we have computed the bearing stresses. The bearing stresses are acting at the contact area between the plate and the bolt. And Finally, we have computed the principal stresses and the stress invariant. Now, I have set some questions for you to think about based on the lessons we have learned today, based on the discussions we had today. And these are what are the maximum normal and shear stress in an axially loaded bar. This we have discussed in lesson 2 as well as in lesson 3. And then what is the relation between these two stresses? What is, what is the relation between the normal stress and the shearing stress? What are the stress invariants and why are they called invariants? Think about it and we will discuss this particular problem or this question in detail. And then what is the value of shear stress on a principal plane? So, go through the lesson, you will get the answer of these questions in the lesson itself, where we have discussed the various phases of stresses, how they are occurring, how we are arriving at the values of the principal stresses. 
what are how to compute the principal stresses on any plane and uh, what is the value of the shear stress at that principal plane. Thank you.